So I, I'm going to talk about the three Fs of, uh, of front-end engineering. Uh, my name is Marco. I'm Marco W on the internet. Uh, I'm the founder of Simplab, so you heard about us uh, already from Jessica and Toby and yesterday during my announcement. So we help clients uh, across the world really uh, building things for the web, uh, particularly with Ember, and we help organizing this event as well as we kind of want to support uh, the European Ember community and like, uh, we all have a great time at Emberfest every year. So the three Fs uh, of front-end engineering. Uh, obviously the first one is framework fatigue, right? As uh, many of us have experienced, but now it's kind of not, not an issue anymore because we are settled on Ember, which is why we're here. Uh, and the second one is obviously what the fuck was the inventor of JavaScript even thinking when when inventing the language, oh, sorry, <laughs> too, too far. When inventing the language, right? Like array equals not array, that's a great idea, let's do that. Um, and there's many more of these things, right? And I, I, I sort of revealed that little side dog already. This is obviously James Gosling, the inventor of Java. Uh, that's Brendan Eich, the inventor of JavaScript. And then the third F in front-end in engineering obviously still is fear of Internet Explorer. <laughs> um, <laughs> Of course, we have Edge now, but like, IE 10 and 11 still like, shed fear and misery around the globe, I guess. Um, but no, like, while all these uh, points are probably valid, these are not the three Fs that I want to talk about. Uh, actually, I want to talk about three Fs that all uh, stand for the same word, which is fast. Uh, because we all care about fastness, right? Like, probably more than anything else, because in, like there's lots of value in fastness, often like direct business value. Uh, first of all, we want to like, write things fast. We want to improve our, our products in short iterations, and we want to like, iterate through like many of these iterations in short time and like release stuff stuff in like a, a quick uh, cycle. And like in the Ember community, we often refer to that, or like I guess in the community in general, we refer to that as moving fast without breaking things, right? Uh, contrary to that Facebook motto. Uh, and Ember has us, has us covered pretty well, right? Like we have our solid conventions and patterns. Uh, we have our community agreed upon solutions where like all of the community focuses on one way of doing things and then that way it like, gets really solid and, 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 and well tested and thought through and so on. Um, and so we can all concentrate on shipping features, right? Like inc improving our, our products uh, like in, in quick and, and short iterations, like I said. Um, then the second uh, fastness that we care about is running fast, right? Like once the application started up, we needed to run fast regardless of the environment, like ideally on like feature phones as well. Um, and as we know, Ember has a not so bright past in that regard. Uh, there were lots of performance problems in the rendering layer, but now we have Glimmer in the Glimmer VM, uh, and we now have industry-leading performance. And I'm sure Chad is gonna, gonna talk more, uh, more about that in the afternoon and what's coming a bit. Um, so this is sort of, a, uh, sort of a solved problem in the community as well. Uh, and then the third fastness is uh, we need to make sure that we deliver our application fast. And this is where uh, like this talk gets a bit similar to the one that Simon uh, presented. So once we've wrote something fast, we needed to run fast in the browser. But before that, we needed to get to the browser in a fast way, ideally. right? So this is basically like loading and startup performance of the application. Um, and that is only to some extent a thing of the framework and, and supporting tools, but um, it's actually a very wide field with lots of uh, f like factors that are relevant uh, and, and, and lots of techniques that you can apply, and it's also pretty uh, fast moving forward. Um, and this is also what I'm going to talk uh, like about in this talk. So how can we deliver our fast applications that we've wrote in a fast way even faster to our users' devices. Uh, and yeah, like I said, most of this is not really specific to Ember even, it's just like generic web performance uh, stuff, sort of. Uh, we'll be using a demo application, which is like an open source Ember app is probably a pretty good example, so we're using the Ember Guides app. And this is of course, um, 
not to mock like the learning team's efforts and show how bad that is, but it, it's more to show how easy it often is to improve stuff significantly. Uh, and of course, we want to com uh, contribute all of the stuff that I want to, uh, that I'm going to present here uh, back. Uh, one thing that I have to say, we are, we deployed our own version of the application to Netlify, so we can like. Uh, uh, play around with different things, so we're not looking at the actual production deployment of the Amber Guides app. Uh, first of all, uh, tools. So when you start uh, looking at, at loading performance, uh, you would usually start with the uh, Chrome Inspectors Network tab. Um, and you uh, want to make sure you have a few things set up the right way, because otherwise you won't get meaningful data. Uh, one thing that you uh, want to make sure you set up correctly is you want to enable those large request rows that just show you a bit more data for each request at a glance and make your life easier. Uh, second, you obviously want to disable your cache because if you're just looking at the cache loading performance, that's not really what you care about because that's usually pretty okay. Um, then uh, next thing you want to do, you want to enable that priority column. Uh, we see what request priorities are. Uh, Later, you can enable that just right-clicking on that column header, uh, and you can select the columns that you're seeing. Um, and then lastly, you want to uh, simulate a slower connection, because if you're testing with your office Wi-Fi, then that's probably not uh, going to give you meaningful data. And that's also not really the case that you're optimizing for, right? Like somebody sitting on a desktop or a powerful MacBook Pro in an office uh, with a good connection, like that's not you're not solving their problems, but you're solving the problems that people have uh, loading your apps on mobile devices, like in the subway or maybe somewhere with a bad connection or uh, uh, something like that. And also, like slowing everything, everything down just makes it a bit easier to understand the result, right? Like if something takes five milliseconds and you optimize it to four milliseconds, you don't really know is that like actually 20% improvement or is it just one millisecond, right? But if something takes five seconds, it's just much easier to to see uh, uh, what you're changing. So um, let's look at where we start, sort of, with the um, Ember Guides app, like what our, our, our um, initial loading characteristics are here. Uh, so first of all, we see DOM content loaded happens after 12.5 seconds, and that's obviously, of course, not the time that you are seeing on your notebooks, but like I said, we're simulating a slow 3G connection, right? So this is sort of a worst case scenario. So DOM content load is basically when all the, cr the critical assets uh, that the page requires uh, have loaded and when the application like, begins starting up, right? Like that's when, when, when JavaScript parsing and compilation happens and then the code runs and like, your application. Uh, then your application actually starts up like the route model hooks are invoked and so on. And, and it uh, refers to that line in the network, uh, in the waterfall uh, chart. Right, um, And the page finishes loading after 25 seconds. That's not really such an important measurement. That's basically when everything uh, has been loaded, also stuff like I don't know, Google Analytics or whatever that you don't care about so much. Um, right? And the, the time when the application has fully started up, that is somewhere in between. Right? In this case, it's around 19 seconds, so basically the, the, uh, the application is fully started up when the JavaScript uh, that has been downloaded is passed, compiled, it, it runs, like the routes load their model stuff, the rendering happened and stuff. Like that's the point in time when the application is, is ready to be used, right? Which is also uh, referred to TTI, like time to interactive, and that's really the time that you mostly care about. Um, if you're using server-side rendering, you might care about other times as well, like the first time the user sees something, but in general, you care the most about time to interactive because that's when the user can actually start using the application. Um, so if we look at that, then the question, of course, is what's limiting here? Like, why does it take 12.5 seconds and which is like the first thing that we should look at? Uh, obviously, Vendor.js uh, here is the limiting factor. Uh, it outlasts all of the other uh, um, important requests and it finishes around 12.5 seconds, which is like when DOM, coded, when DOM content loaded uh, is fired because Vendor.js is like the last thing that is needed for DOM content loaded and like once that is finished, the event is triggered. 
Um, and you see something else. You see that it is only loaded with medium priority. Uh, and the problem with that is that lower priority requests might get, get queued behind higher priority ones. Uh, that is actually not happen, uh, happening here, but you don't want that to be possible for your most critical resource, of course. Um, and then only once the application is, or um, only once VendorJS completes loading, the application begins starting up, the routes model hooks are invoked, and it loads even more data. All right, so like, even once VendorJS is dead, uh, the user still needs to wait for a few uh, more seconds. Um, I want to just quickly look about how loading a website even works. And I have like, a little schematic uh, here. It's like, very much simplified. Uh, it's just a high-level view. Um, so uh, here we have the server on the right, the browser on the left, of course. Uh, first thing that happens, obviously, is the browser requesting like, the document. Uh, then the server responds with that, the browser starts parsing that HTML until it uh, discovers the script tag, right? Like, then it goes and gets the script tag, uh, the, browser, uh, the server responds with it, and only then can, can uh, like the browser start parsing, compiling the script and running the script. The problem with um, this is that all of this is actually lost time, right? Like we have to wait until we receive the HTML response. We have to start parsing it until we discover the script tag, and only then do we start loading it, right? So you're wasting quite a lot of time because you know already like, um, um, in advance that you will need the script tag eventually, right? Uh, so how can we load, it, uh, load that, that script tag sooner um, than uh, what's happening in this case here. And the answer to that is uh, resource hints. Resource hints basically allows to give the user a hint that it will need some particular uh, response later on that it doesn't know about yet. Uh, and we can give that hint early on in the top of the document. So you can just add that link uh, rel preload uh, to the document header and that will make the browser start loading that resource already, and then once it continued parsing the document and finally reaches the script tag at the, at the bottom of the body, then we'll recognize it's loading the script tag already, right? So you're just loading it sooner, and so it can, can uh, so it will complete sooner. Um, or you could do that even a bit earlier. Uh, there's also a link header which is basically just the same thing, but the benefit is that you don't have to wait uh, until, or the browser doesn't have to wait until it receives the, the response body and actually starts parsing the HTML, but it uh, will see that resource in, in, in the, the headers of the response, which is slightly faster even. Uh, so basically what that means, if we use resource since we're going from this to this, right? We are just starting to load the JavaScript file much earlier, so it uh, uh, finishes loading uh, much earlier, and we have like, much saved time in our um, application startup. So that is equivalent to essentially moving stuff, stuff in the waterfall chart to the left, right? Like the further something is on the left, that means the, the, uh, the sooner it starts, and the sooner it starts, the sooner it will, will complete loading. Uh, so, uh, like for the Ember Guides app, we just added these header. In reality, those will have like the, the hashes, of course, but I left those out for simplification. Uh, so now we are uh, like starting to load those bundles much sooner. Application bundles, well, of course, because uh, like uh, uh, the two are essential for the application to start up, of course. Uh, and the result is this. So we. We see that the JavaScript bundles are now loading sooner. They are now loading with higher priority, but the effect is not really huge, right? Like we are about 200 milliseconds faster, which is not bad, but there's only so much we can do here. But maybe we can preload more things, right? And if you look at the waterfall chart, you see that the application actually loads static data, right? It's basically just JSON files that it loads uh, from the application and uh, um, uh, model methods, but the problem with this is that these requests are only triggered after DOM content loaded, so after 12.5 seconds, which is very late, right? Or 
12.3 seconds with the, with the uh, link preload headers now, but it's still very late, although we know from the beginning which JSON files we're going to need. Uh, so we, uh, we should preload those. It's not really necessary here to use a header because it, it doesn't really make a big difference because they will be loaded while the vendor.js is loaded anyway, right? So, and that will outlast the request for the JSON files anyway. So we just add, add tags. Uh, in reality, you would want to make that version part of the build process using probably like an in-repo add-on and not like hard code this into index.html so you would update it every time like there's a new Ember release, but that's relatively straight, straightforward with Ember CLI. Um, also, you realize that we, we are saying cross-origin anonymous. It's not actually a cause request because the, the files are loaded from the same domain, um, but it's still going through that cause subsystem in the browser, so you have to say cross-origin cross origin anonymous. It's just something to remember. And think. Uh, that's it. So the result of this is that uh, when we look at the waterfall uh, chart again, that you see the JSON files are no, now loaded um, much sooner, right? Like they are now loaded in parallel with the vendor.js. Uh, DOM content loaded is slightly slower now because more things share the available bandwidth, right? Like we are now loading the JSON files at the same time as the vendor.js loads and other things like the CSS and the application bundle. So DOM content loaded is slightly slower, but the big benefit is that once the routes model hooks um, are called, then basically they resolve immediately as the browser has the resource that they are trying to load already. Right, so basically uh, uh, what that means in consequence then is that um, DOM content loaded is more or less the same now as application startup time and time to interactive, right? So we, we, are, we went from, from time to interactive at 19 seconds to time to interactive at about like 12.5 seconds, which is a huge improvement of course, right? Um, um, although um, obviously, uh, after DOM content loaders, there's still pass and compilation and execution time for the JavaScript, so it's like not quite there, but it's like still a dramatic improvement of at least like five to six seconds uh, in this case. Uh, so uh, here we had a m much bigger impact than we had before, right? Because the vendor.js was already loaded pretty early on, so like there's not so much you can do, but everything that is loaded very late in the process, but you know you will need it later on, there's like always big uh, room for improvement preloading those things, like the JSON files in this example. Uh, a few warnings about uh, preloading. Uh, preloading does not work if you have, like, sub, if you're using sub-resource integrity. If you have integrity attributes on the script tags at the, bot the bottom of the, the, the HTML body that the browser will then C, like it, it would ignore basically everything that had been preloaded previously and always load that resource again, which actually means you're loading it twice and slows uh, things down, right? And I have first-hand experience, like this uh, cost me two hours while preparing this talk until I figured out that was actually the problem. Um, and then, of course, you don't want to preload everything, right? Because if you're preloading everything, you're preloading nothing because everything just loads at the same time. And um, obviously, all of the things that load share the available bandwidth, um, which is not what you want. In that context, you might have heard of HTTP push, which is a bit similar. Uh, instead of like giving the browser a hint that it will need something later on, you're just pushing the thing that it will need uh, right away. But there are some problems with it. There's a great, great blog post by, by Jake Archibald on the topic. Um, it's relatively hard to get right. You might be pushing stuff that the uh, user already has, so you might be wasting people's bandwidth and so on. So in general, you would probably want to use preload uh, and not HTTP to push. Um, what else can you do? Um, uh, preloading is, of course, great if you know the URL uh, of the thing that you need uh, upfront. But um, in reality, in particular, uh, data that you're loading from, from, your, uh, from your routes um, is dependent on several factors, right? Like maybe locked in user, maybe the URL that they're looking at, right? That might um, influence IDs of the stuff that you're loading from your API. So in, in general, um, uh, things that you load look more like this maybe. 
uh, right, depending on your current user, depending on, on the URL and so on. Uh, so you, you cannot really have preloads for all of these, these things, like all of the potential uh, things that, that the routes might be loading. Um, or you could maybe do it, but then you end up in complexity hell and, and might actually have a negative impact. So how could we improve this case where we don't know the URL up front? Uh, and in order to understand how we could make that better, we, we need to look at what a request actually consists of. It's not like that a request is just like only download time or whatever, like there's more to it. Uh, so first of all, obviously the browser has to do a DNS lookup. Like, it needs to figure out what is the IP of that ex um, external data API.com that I want to load data from. Uh, second thing needs to do, it needs to establish an HTTP connection, right? Like there's some, some time that, that needs as well. Then it needs to do the uh, um, SSL handshake and um, of course you're using SSL for everything you're doing, hopefully. Uh, and then there's that big chunk of time to first byte, which is mostly server time and that's just waiting time for the browser where it waits to receive the data always includes compression and also includes compression like gzip and stuff. And um, then there's often a relatively short download time. Not for the vendor JS, of course, because there's big, but for your data uh, APIs, the download time would usually be, be relatively short because you're like, usually not loading huge blobs of JSON. Um, so if we don't know the full URL, we usually still know the host that we will get data from, right? And we can uh, have the browser pre-connect to that host at least. Uh, so why we're not able to like, move the full request uh, like more to the left in the waterfall diagram, we are at least able to like, move some of that to the left in the waterfall. Uh, so basically we're going from this to this once the request is actually made, right? Because the, pre, the connection had been established ahead of time already. Um, so it, it just leads less stuff when the request is actually made then. Uh, so we saw that, that preload and preconnect um, like make the browser aware of, of, of resources that it will need later on that it doesn't, uh, uh, that it had not seen yet. And then uh, like those resources would just be available sooner when the browser finally sees them and needs them. Uh, but what would be even faster, and of course even fast, or the fastest request is making no request at all, right? So if the browser has that resource that it needs already, then that, like, that's the ideal case. Uh, and MSCLI has pretty good support. So we all know that it uses fingerprints for our file names in production, right? So uh, like when the file's content, changes, the name changes, and if the name stays the same, then you can be sure that the content is the same. Uh, and then if you combine that with infinite caching, uh, like that is pretty good already. You just need to make sure you add the immutable uh, keyword there, because otherwise uh, the browser will always go and revalidate uh, the resource. And if you use this caching configuration, this is basically as good as service workers. So in both cases, the browser will just use what it has in the cache, like either service worker cache or um, HTTP cache, and like, uh, your request resolves immediately, basically. The only difference is uh, that the service worker cache is less likely to be cleared. Like the HTTP cache is, I think, smaller and more likely to be cleared. Uh, but if the resources are in the cache, then both have basically the same performance characteristics. Um, but because of that, you would probably still want to use a service worker, in particular uh, because it's now supported on most of the devices that you care about. Uh, but that's a different talk, because like, we've all heard like, numerous service worker and PWA talks, I'm sure. Um, so, uh, but still, looking at the, the previous example with cache, we see that everything is obviously much faster. Uh, the JavaScript assets are loaded in zero milliseconds. They're just read from disk. Uh, and DOM content loaded happens in 4.3 seconds. And this is even without service workers. Like I said, we just use a, a good caching uh, configuration. But of course, in reality, you need to ask yourself whether this is a likely scenario to happen in the real world, right? Like this is when the user has everything that they could have in the cache, um, in the cache and everything is usable, right? So how likely is this to happen like to your users actually? And that of course depends on how often do, you, do your um, assets change uh, and how frequently are your users visiting, right? So if you 
users are typically visiting once a week, but you have five deployments a week, and every time change your assets, then uh, they will never be able to get any, anything from the caches, except images maybe or so, but those are not really the critical uh, things you're looking at. Um, I'm not saying you should never release any changes, of course, but it's, it's good to be aware of like, what, what the things that you're doing result in, right? And this is a bit similar to what Simon uh, showed. So we uh, use this thing as part of our uh, CI system, which tells us uh, what assets change uh, as a result of merging a pull request. And basically, we, we, we just uh, build master, we build the pull request, and then we compare the results and just see where the differences are. Um, so this is actionable information, right? And you might use that information, for example, if you do like dependency updates of five dependencies in your system. Do you do like every dependency update individually and release that to production um, individu individually every time invalidating everybody's vendor JS? Or do you maybe uh, combine all these uh, dependency updates in one production release so you're only invalidating people's caches once? Um, like there's no clear guidance, but it's like uh, good to be aware of of um, of things and 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 the consequences. Um, obviously, we don't only look at which assets change, but also by how much. Right? This is um, very valuable if you're trying to identify um, like things that were potentially added by accident or so. Like maybe you. You have a library and you add like all of the locales for that, and then you have like 15 locales, although your application not, um, only supports English and whatever. Uh, there is really uh, like valuable information uh, for these things, and also like you might have like a very small feature that you're building in one PR, but you're adding a huge dependency, and then uh, you have to ask yourself like, is this really worth it, or do I just like write a five-line function and maintain that myself? Right? Like that's not always good, but sometimes might be good. Um, this is available as a tool, like we released an asset size reporter, you can just run that as part of your CI uh, system. Also, you, uh, uh, you want to understand what's actually in your bundle. Uh, Simon introduced this already, so this helps you identify and understand better what's actually in your bundle and then uh, reveal things that were added by accident or by mistake or that you don't actually need maybe. So you can drill down here and see like all the modules and how big they are and so on as Simon showed in the previous talk. Um, there's much more uh, to talk about performance. We only looked at like very few um, specific things here. There's HTTP2. It's an easy topic. You just always use HTTP2. Uh, CDNs, also pretty easy. Always use CDNs. If you don't, then you're missing out. And like uh, CDNs are really, uh, really uh, cheap now, so it's not even like a big decision in terms of business. Uh, there's server-side rendering, of course, that influences performance. Uh, it improves perceived performance. There are ways, I think, to make it even uh, improve actual startup performance. Uh, there's things like inlining uh, critical CSS, so the CSS that the browser needs to show, like the, the uh, or to render the pages already there, and it doesn't have to go and fetch a remote resource. Um, we use the network tab here as kind of a first uh, starting point. In reality, you would want to use other things like web page test.org, for example, that allows you to basically do the same stuff that you do in the network tab, but from actual remote locations, and then you configure like, the connection it should be using, and so on. But then eventually, you want to have real user monitoring, so the things that you see in your net, uh, network tab and on web page test.org, like, those give you a good idea of the loading behavior, but the thing that you actually care about is how does that behave on like, the real user's devices. Um, um, images are a pretty big topic uh, when it comes to, to performance optimization. Uh, like there are several optimization images. There's many, many different compression algorithms uh, for JPEGs, uh, for example. Uh, there's different techniques where you just like show a, a placeholder image that's maybe just some base 64 encoded image that's like, right in your DOM, and then you uh, replace that with a real image once that has loaded. There's bundle splitting, of course. You can use like engines, like lazy loaded engines. Ember, um, auto import helps with that as well. Uh, there's the new RFC by Tom. Or I, I think it's just a, a, an issue uh, about maybe creating an 
IFC for loading um, ES6 mo uh, modules individually, so um, that you're loading less and smaller things, and things are likely more stable in your cache, right? Because individual modules, they, an individual module that changes wouldn't invalidate the whole thing, but only itself, right? So uh, you would just have to load a few kilobytes again. Uh, so, uh, like I said, it's a huge field. There are many things to consider. Um, many things will be specific to your concrete application and only apply to that, but maybe not to other ones. Uh, but I cannot cover all of that, of course. So, uh, but if you have questions, talk to me later. Thanks.